This is Audible. Audible Studios presents The Assassin's Blade, The Throne of Glass Novellas. Written by Sarah J. Mass. Narrated by Elizabeth Evans. Chapter 1 Seated in the council room of the Assassin's Keep, Selena Sardothian leaned back in her chair. It's past four in the morning, she said, adjusting the folds of her crimson silk dressing gown and crossing her bare legs beneath the wooden table. This had better be important. Perhaps if you hadn't been reading all night, you wouldn't be so exhausted, snapped the young man seated across from her. She ignored him and studied the four other people assembled in the underground chamber. All male, all far older than she, and all refusing to meet her stare. A chill that didn't have to do with the drafty room ran down her spine. Picking at her manicured nails, Selena schooled her features into neutrality. The five assassins gathered at the long table, including herself, were five of Arobin Hommel's seven most trusted companions. This meeting was undeniably important. She'd known that from the moment the serving girl pounded on her door, insisting Selena come downstairs and not even bother to get dressed. When Arobin summoned you, you didn't keep him waiting. Thankfully, her sleepwear was as exquisite as her daytime wardrobe, and cost nearly as much. Still, being sixteen in a room with men made her keep an eye on the neckline of her robe. Her beauty was a weapon, one she kept honed, but it could also be a vulnerability. Arobin Hommel, king of the assassins, lounged at the head of the table, his auburn hair shining in the light from the glass chandelier. His silver eyes met hers, and he frowned. It might have just been the late hour, but Selena could have sworn that her mentor was paler than usual. Her stomach twisted. Grigori's been caught, Arobin finally said. Well, that would explain one person missing from this meeting. His mission was a trap. He's now being held in the royal dungeons. Selena sighed through her nose. This was why she'd been awakened? She tapped a slippered foot on the marble floor. Then kill him, she said. She'd never liked Grigori anyway. When she was ten, she'd fed his horse a bag of candy, and he'd thrown a dagger at her head for it. She'd caught the dagger, of course. And ever since, Grigori had borne the scar on his cheek from her return throw. Kill Grigori? demanded Sam, the young man seated at Arobin's left, a place that usually went to Ben, Arobin's second in command. Selena knew very well what Sam Cortland thought of her. She'd known since they were children, when Arobin took her in and declared her, not Sam, to be his protege and heir. That hadn't stopped Sam from trying to undermine her at every turn. And now, at seventeen, Sam was still a year older than she, and he still hadn't forgotten that he would always be second best. She bristled at the sight of Sam in Ben's seat. Ben would probably throttle Sam for it when he arrived or she could just save Ben the effort and do it herself. Selena looked to Arobin. Why hadn't he reprimanded Sam for sitting in Ben's place? Arobin's face, still handsome despite the silver starting to show in his hair, remained impassive. She hated that unreadable mask, especially when controlling her own expressions and temper remained a tad difficult. If Grigori's been caught, Selena drawled, brushing back a strand of her long golden hair. Then the protocol's simple. Send an apprentice to slip something into his food. Nothing painful, she added as the men around her tensed. Just enough to silence him before he talks. Which Grigori might very well do if he was in the royal dungeons. Most criminals who went in there never came out again. Not alive. And not in any recognizable shape. The location of the Assassin's Keep was a well-guarded secret, one she'd been trained to keep until her last breath. But even if she didn't, no one was likely to believe that an elegant manor house on a very respectable street in Rifthold was home to some of the greatest assassins in the world. What better place to hide than in the middle of the capital city? And if he's already talked? challenged Sam. And if Grigori's already talked? 
she said. Then kill everyone who heard. Sam's brown eyes flashed as she gave him a little smile that she knew made him irate. Selena turned to Aerobin. But you didn't need to drag us here to decide this. You already gave the order, didn't you? Aerobin nodded, his mouth a thin line. Sam choked back his objection and looked toward the crackling hearth beside the table. The firelight cast the smooth, elegant panes of Sam's face into light and shadow. A face, she'd been told, that could have earned him a fortune if he'd followed in his mother's footsteps. But Sam's mother had opted instead to leave him with assassins, not courtesans, before she died. Silence fell, and a roaring noise filled her ears as Arobin took a breath. Something was wrong. What else? she asked, leaning forward. The other assassins focused on the table. Whatever had happened, they knew. Why hadn't Arobin told her first? Arobin's silver eyes became steel. Ben was killed. Selena gripped the arms of her chair. What? Ben. Ben, the ever-smiling assassin who had trained her as often as Arobin had. Ben, who had once mended her shattered right hand. Ben, the seventh and final member of Arobin's inner circle. He was barely thirty years old. Selena's lips pulled back from her teeth. What do you mean, killed? Arobin eyed her, and a glimmer of grief flashed across his face. Five years Ben's senior, Arobin had grown up with Ben. They'd been trained together. Ben had seen to it that his friend became the unrivaled king of the assassins, and never questioned his place as Arobin's second. Her throat closed up. It was supposed to be Grigori's mission, Arobin said quietly. I don't know why Ben was involved, or who betrayed them. They found his body near the castle gates. Do you have his body? she demanded. She had to see it. Had to see him one last time. See how he died. How many wounds it had taken to kill him. No, Arobin said. Why the hell not? Her fists clenched and unclenched. Because the place was swarming with guards and soldiers. Sam burst out, and she whipped her head to him. How do you think we learned about this in the first place? Arobin had sent Sam to see why Ben and Grigori were missing? If we grabbed his body, Sam said, refusing to back down from her glare, it would have led them right to the keep. You're assassins, she growled at him. You're supposed to be able to retrieve a body without being seen. If you'd been there, you would have done the same. Selena pushed her chair back so hard it flipped over. If I'd been there, I would have killed all of them to get Ben's body back. She slammed her hands on the table, rattling the glasses. Sam shot to his feet, a hand on the hilt of his sword. Oh, listen to you, ordering us about like you run the guild. But not yet, Selena. He shook his head. Not yet. Enough! Arobin snapped, rising from his chair. Selena and Sam didn't move. None of the other assassins spoke, though they gripped their various weapons. She'd seen firsthand what fights at the keep were like. The weapons were as much for the bearer's own safety as they were to prevent her and Sam from doing serious damage to each other. I said enough! If Sam took one step toward her, drew his sword a fraction of an inch, that concealed dagger in her robe would find itself a new home in his neck. Arobin moved first, grabbing Sam's chin in one hand, forcing the young man to look at him. Check yourself, or I'll do it for you, boy, he murmured. You're a fool for picking a fight with her tonight. Selena bit down on her reply. She could handle Sam tonight, or any other night for that matter. If it came down to a fight, she'd win. She always beat Sam. But Sam released the hilt of his sword. After a moment, Arobin removed his grip on Sam's face, but didn't step away. Sam kept his gaze on the floor as he strode to the far side of the council room. Crossing his arms, he leaned against the stone wall. She could still reach him. One flick of her wrist and his throat would spout blood. Selena, Arobin said. 
his voice echoing in the silent room. Enough blood had been spilled tonight. They didn't need another dead assassin. Ben. Ben was dead and gone. And she'd never again run into him in the halls of the keep. He'd never set her injuries with his cool, deft hands. Never coax a laugh from her with a joke or a lewd anecdote. Selena, Arobin warned again. I'm done, Selena snapped. She rolled her neck, running a hand through her hair. She stalked to the door, but paused on the threshold. Just so you know, she said, speaking to all of them but still watching Sam, I'm going to retrieve Ben's body. A muscle feathered in Sam's jaw, though he wisely kept his eyes averted. But don't expect me to extend the same courtesy to the rest of you when your time comes. With that, she turned on her heel and ascended the spiral staircase to the manor above. Fifteen minutes later, no one stopped her when she slipped out the front gate and into the silent city streets. Chapter Two Two months, three days, and about eight hours later, the clock on the mantel chimed noon. Captain Rolf, Lord of the Pirates, was late. Then again, so were Selena and Sam, but Rolf had no excuse. Not when they were already two hours behind schedule. Not when they were meeting in his office. And it wasn't her fault for being tardy. She couldn't control the winds, and those skittish sailors had certainly taken their time sailing into the archipelago of the Dead Islands. She didn't want to think about how much gold Arobin had spent bribing a crew to sail into the heart of pirate territory. But Skull's Bay was on an island, so they hadn't really had a choice about their mode of transportation. Selena, concealed behind a far too stuffy black cloak, tunic, and ebony mask, rose from her seat before the pirate lord's desk. How dare he make her wait? He knew precisely why they were here, after all. Three assassins had been found murdered by pirate hands, and Arabin had sent her to be his personal dagger, to extract retribution, preferably the gold kind, for what their deaths would cost the Assassin's Guild. With every minute he makes us wait, Selena said to Sam, the mask making her words low and soft. I'm adding an extra ten gold pieces to his debt. Sam, who didn't wear a mask over his handsome features, crossed his arms and scowled. You'll do no such thing. Arobin's letter is sealed, and it's going to remain that way. Neither of them had been particularly happy when Arobin announced that Sam would be sent to the Dead Islands with Selena, especially when Ben's body, which Selena had retrieved, had barely been in the ground for two months. The sting of losing him hadn't exactly worn off. Her mentor had called Sam an escort, but Selena knew what his presence meant. A watchdog. Not that she'd do anything bad when she was about to meet the pirate lord of Aurelia. It was a once-in-a-lifetime chance. Even though the tiny, mountainous island and ramshackle port city hadn't really made much of an impression so far. She'd been expecting a manor house like the Assassin's Keep, or at least a fortified aging castle. But the pirate lord occupied the entire top floor of a rather suspect tavern. The ceilings were low, the wooden floors creaked, and the cramped room combined with the already sizzling temperature of the southern islands meant Selena was sweating buckets beneath her clothing. But her discomfort was worth it. As they strode through Skull's Bay, heads had turned at the sight of her. The billowing black cape, the exquisite clothing, and the mask transformed her into a whisper of darkness. A little intimidation never did any harm. Selena walked to the wooden desk and picked up a piece of paper, her black gloved hands turning it over to read the contents. A weather log. How dull. What are you doing? Selena lifted another piece of paper. If his pirateness can't be bothered to clean for us, then I don't see why I can't have a look. He'll be here any second, Sam hissed. She picked up a flattened map examining the dots and markings along the coastline of their continent. Something small and round gleamed beneath the map, and she slipped it into her pocket before Sam could notice. Oh, hush, 
she said, opening the hutch on the wall adjacent to the desk. With these creaky floors, we'll hear him a mile off. The hutch was crammed with rolled scrolls, quills, the odd coin, and some very old, very expensive-looking brandy. She pulled out a bottle, swirling the amber liquid in the sunlight streaming through the tiny porthole window. Care for a drink? No, Sam snapped, half-twisting in his seat to watch the door. Put it back, now. She cocked her head, twirled the brandy once more in its crystal bottle, and set it down. Sam sighed. Beneath her mask, Selena grinned. He can't be a very good lord, she said, if this is his personal office. Sam gave a stifled cry of dismay as Selena plopped into the giant armchair behind the desk and set about opening the pirate's ledgers and turning over his papers. His handwriting was cramped and near illegible, his signature nothing more than a few loops and jagged peaks. She didn't know what she was looking for, exactly. Her brows rose a bit at the sight of a piece of purple, perfumed paper, signed by someone named Jacqueline. She leaned back in the chair, propping her feet on the desk, and read it. Damn it, Selena! She raised her brows, but realized he couldn't see. The mask and clothes were a necessary precaution, one that made it far easier to protect her identity. In fact, all of Arobin's assassins had been sworn to secrecy about who she was under the threat of endless torture and eventual death. Selena huffed, though her breath only made the interior of the insufferable mask hotter. All that the world knew about Selena Sardothian, Otterlin's assassin, was that she was female, and she wanted to keep it that way. How else would she be able to stroll the broad avenues of Rifthold, or infiltrate grand parties by posing as foreign nobility? And while she wished that Rolf could have the chance to admire her lovely face, she had to admit that the disguise also made her rather imposing, especially when the mask warped her voice into a growling rasp. Get back in your seat. Sam reached for a sword that wasn't there. The guards at the entrance to the inn had taken their weapons. Of course, none of them had realized that Sam and Selena were weapons themselves. They could kill Rolf just as easily with their bare hands. Or you'll fight me. She tossed the love letter onto the desk. Somehow I don't think that'd make a favorable impression on our new acquaintances. She crossed her arms behind her head, gazing at the turquoise sea visible between the dilapidated buildings that made up Skull's Bay. Sam half rose from his chair. Just get back in your seat. I've spent the past ten days at sea. Why should I sit in that uncomfortable chair when this one's far more suited to my tastes? Sam let out a growl. Before he could speak, the door opened. Sam froze, but Selena only inclined her head in greeting as Captain Rolf, Lord of the Pirates, entered his office. I'm glad to see you've made yourself at home. The tall, dark-haired man shut the door behind him. Bold move, considering who was waiting in his office. Selena remained where she sat. Well, he certainly wasn't what she'd expected. It wasn't every day that she was surprised, but she'd imagined him to be a bit dirtier and far more flamboyant. Considering the tales she'd heard of Rolf's wild adventures, she had trouble believing that this man, lean but not wiry, well-dressed but not overtly so, and probably in his late twenties, was the legendary pirate. Perhaps he, too, kept his identity a secret from his enemies. Sam stood, bowing his head slightly. Sam Cortland, he said by way of greeting. Rolf extended a hand, and Selena watched his tattooed palm and fingers as they clasped Sam's broad hand. The map. That was the mythic map that he'd sold his soul to have inked on his hands, the map of the world's oceans, the map that changed to show storms, foes, and treasure. I suppose you don't need an introduction. Rolf turned to her. No. Selena leaned back farther in his desk chair. I suppose I don't. Rolf chuckled, a crooked smile spreading across his tanned face. He stepped to the hutch, 
giving her the chance to examine him further. Broad shoulders, head held high, a casual grace to his movements that came with knowing he had all the power here. He didn't have a sword, either. Another bold move. Wise, too, given that they could easily use his weapons against him. Brandy? He asked. No, thank you, Sam said. Selena felt Sam's eyes hard upon her, willing her to take her feet off Rolf's desk. With that mask on, Rolf mused, I don't think you could have a drink anyway. He poured brandy for himself and took a long sip. You must be boiling in all that clothing. Selena lowered her feet to the ground as she ran her hands along the curved edge of his desk, stretching out her arms. I'm used to it. Rolf drank again, watching her for a heartbeat over the rim of his glass. His eyes were a striking shade of sea green, as bright as the water just a few blocks away. Lowering the glass, he approached the end of the desk. I don't know how you handle things in the north, but down here we like to know who we're speaking to. She cocked her head. As you said, I don't need an introduction. And as for the privilege of seeing my beautiful face, I'm afraid that's something few men receive. Rolf's tattooed fingers tightened on the glass. Get out of my chair. Across the room, Sam tensed. Selena examined the contents of Rolf's desk again. She clicked her tongue, shaking her head. You really need to work on organizing this mess. She sensed the pirate grabbing for her shoulder and was on her feet before his fingers could graze the black wool of her cloak. He stood a good head taller than her. I wouldn't do that if I were you, she crooned. Rolf's eyes gleamed with a challenge. You're in my city and on my island. Only a hand's breadth separated them. You're not in any position to give me orders. Sam cleared his throat, but Selena stared up into Rolf's face. His eyes scanned the blackness beneath the hood of her cloak, the smooth black mask, the shadows that concealed any trace of her features. Selena? Sam warned, clearing his throat again. Very well. She sighed loudly and stepped around Rolf as if he were nothing but a piece of furniture in her way. She sank into the chair beside Sam, who flashed her a glare that burned enough to melt the entirety of the frozen wastes. She could feel Rolf watching their every movement, but he merely adjusted the lapels of his midnight blue tunic before sitting down. Silence fell, interrupted only by the cry of gulls circling above the city and the shouting of pirates calling to one another in the filthy streets. Well? Rolf rested his forearms on the desk. Sam glanced at her. Her move. You know precisely why we're here, Selena said. But perhaps all that brandy's gone to your head. Shall I refresh your memory? Rolf gestured with his green, blue, and black hand for her to continue, as if he were a king on his throne listening to the complaints of the rabble. Ass. Three assassins from our guild were found dead in Bellhaven. The one that got away told us they were attacked by pirates. She draped an arm along the back of her chair. Your pirates. And how did the survivor know they were my pirates? She shrugged. Perhaps it was the tattoos that gave them away. All of Rolf's men had their wrists tattooed with an image of a multicolored hand. Rolf opened a drawer in his desk, pulling out a piece of paper and reading the contents. He said, Once I caught wind that Arab and Hamel might blame me, I had the shipyard master of Belhaven send me these records. It seems the incident occurred at three in the morning at the docks. This time Sam answered, That's correct. Rolf set down the paper and lifted his eyes skyward. So, if it was three in the morning, and it took place at the docks, which have no street lamps, as I'm sure you know, she didn't. Then how did your assassins see all of their tattoos? Beneath her mask, Selena scowled. Because it happened three weeks ago, during the full moon. Ah, but it's early spring. Even in Belhaven, nights are still cold. Unless my men were without coats, there was no way for- Enough! 
Selena snapped. I suppose that piece of paper has ten different paltry excuses for your men. She grabbed the satchel from the floor and yanked out the two sealed documents. These are for you. She tossed them on the desk. From our master. A smile tugged on Rolf's lips, but he pulled the documents to him, studying the seal. He held it up to the sunlight. I'm surprised it hasn't been tampered with. His eyes glimmered with mischief. Selena could sense Sam's smugness oozing out of him. With two deft flicks of his wrist, Rolf sliced open both envelopes with a letter knife she somehow hadn't spotted. How had she missed it? A fool's mistake. In the silent minutes that passed as Rolf read the letters, his only reaction was the occasional drumming of his fingers on the wooden desk. The heat was suffocating, and sweat slipped down her back. They were supposed to be here for three days, long enough for Rolf to gather the money he owed them, which, judging by the growing frown on Rolf's face, was quite a lot. Rolf let out a long breath when he finished, and shuffled the papers into alignment. Your master drives a hard bargain, Rolf said, looking from Selena to Sam. But his terms aren't unfair. Perhaps you should have read the letter before you started flinging accusations at me and my men. There will be no retribution for those dead assassins, whose deaths, your master agrees, were not my fault in the least. He must have some common sense, then. Selena quelled the urge to lean forward. If Aerobin wasn't demanding payment for the death of those assassins, then what were they doing here? Her face burned. She'd looked like a fool, hadn't she? If Sam smiled just the slightest bit. Rolf drummed his inked fingers again and ran a hand through his shoulder-length dark hair. As for the trade agreement he's outlined... I'll have my accountant draw up the necessary fees. But you'll have to tell Aerobin that he can't expect any profits until at least the second shipment. Possibly the third. And if he has an issue with that, then he can come down here himself to tell me. For once, Selena was grateful for the mask. It sounded like they'd been sent for some sort of business investment. Sam nodded at Rolf, as if he knew exactly what the pirate lord was talking about. And when can we tell Arobin to expect the first shipment? He asked. Rolf stuffed Arobin's letters into a desk drawer and locked it. The slaves will be here in two days, ready for your departure the day after. I'll even loan you my ship, so you can tell that trembling crew of yours they're free to return to Rifthold tonight, if it pleases them. Selena stared at him. Arobin had sent them here for... for slaves? How could he stoop so disgustingly low? And to tell her she was going to Skulls Bay for one thing, but to really send her here for this? She felt her nostrils flare. Sam had known about this deal. But he'd somehow forgotten to mention the truth behind their visit, even during the ten days they'd spent at sea. As soon as she got him alone, she'd make him regret it. But for now, she couldn't let Rolf catch on to her ignorance. You'd better not botch this. Selena warned the pirate lord. Aerobin won't be pleased if anything goes awry. Rolf chuckled. You have my word that it will all go according to plan. I'm not lord of the pirates for nothing, you know. She leaned forward, flattening her voice into the even tones of a business partner concerned about her investment. How long, exactly, have you been involved in the slave trade? It couldn't have been long. Otterlin had only started capturing and selling slaves two years ago, most of them prisoners of war from whatever territories dared rebel against their conquest. Many of them were from Ilway, but there were still prisoners from Melisande and Fenharrow, or the isolated tribe in the White Fang Mountains. The majority of slaves went to Calicula or Indovier, the continent's largest and most notorious labor camps, to mine for salt and precious metals but more and more slaves were making their way into the households of Otterland's nobility. And for Arobin to make a filthy trade agreement? Some sort of black market deal? It would sully the Assassin's Guild's entire reputation. Believe me, Rolf said, crossing his arms. I have enough experience. You should be more concerned about your master. 
Investing in the slave trade is a guaranteed profit. But he might need to expend more of his resources than he'd like in order to keep our business from reaching the wrong ears. Her stomach turned over. But she feigned disinterest as best she could and said, Arabin is a shrewd businessman. Whatever you can supply, he'll make the most of it. For his sake, I hope that's true. I don't want to risk my name for nothing. Rolf stood, and Selena and Sam rose with him. I'll have the documents signed and returned to you tomorrow. For now, he pointed toward the door. I have two rooms prepared for you. We only need one, she interrupted. Rolf's eyebrows rose suggestively. Beneath her mask, her face burned, and Sam choked on a laugh. One room, two beds. Rolf chuckled, striding to the door and opening it for them. As you wish. I'll have baths drawn for you as well. Selena and Sam followed him out into the narrow, dark hallway. You could both use one, he added with a wink. It took all of her self-restraint to keep from punching him below the belt. Chapter 3 It took them five minutes to search the cramped room for any spy holes or signs of danger. Five minutes for them to lift the framed paintings on the wood-paneled walls, tap at the floorboards, seal the gap between the door and the floor, and cover the window with Sam's weather-worn black cloak. When she was certain that no one could either hear or see her, Selena ripped off her hood, untied the mask, and whirled to face him. Sam, seated on his small bed, which seemed more like a cot, raised his palms to her. Before you bite my head off, he said, keeping his voice quiet just in case, let me say that I went into that meeting knowing as little as you. She glared at him, savoring the fresh air on her sticky, sweaty face. Oh, really? You're not the only one who can improvise. Sam kicked off his boots and hoisted himself farther onto the bed. That man's as much in love with himself as you are. The last thing we need is for him to know that he had the upper hand in there. Selena dug her nails into her palms. Why would Arobin send us here without telling us the true reason? Reprimand Rolf for a crime that had nothing to do with him? Maybe Rolf was lying about the content of the letter. She straightened. That might very well be... He was not lying about the content of the letter, Selena, Sam said. Why would he bother? He has more important things to do. She grumbled a slew of nasty words and paced, her black boots clunking against the uneven floorboards. Pirate lord indeed. This was the best room he could offer them? She was Otterlin's assassin, the right arm of Arobin Hommel, not some backstreet harlot. Regardless, Arobin has his reasons. Sam stretched out on his bed and closed his eyes. Slaves. She spat, dragging a hand through her braided hair, her fingers caught in the plate. What business does Arobin have getting involved in the slave trade? We're better than that. We don't need that money. Unless Arobin was lying. Unless all of his extravagant spending was done with non-existent funds. She'd always assumed that his wealth was bottomless. He'd spent a king's fortune on her upbringing, on her wardrobe alone. Fur, silk, jewels the weekly cost of just keeping herself looking beautiful. Of course, he'd always made it clear that she was to pay him back, and she'd been giving him a cut of her wages to do so, but... Maybe Arobin wanted to increase what wealth he already had. If Ben were alive, he wouldn't have stood for it. Ben would have been as disgusted as she was. Being hired to kill corrupt government officials was one thing, but taking prisoners of war brutalizing them until they stopped fighting back and sentencing them to a lifetime of slavery? Sam opened an eye. Are you going to take a bath, or can I go first? She hurled her cloak at him. He caught it with a single hand and tossed it to the ground. She said, I'm going first. Of course you are. She shot him a dirty look and stormed into the bathroom, slamming the door behind her. Of all the dinners she'd ever attended, this was by far the worst. Not because of the company, which was, she grudgingly admitted, somewhat interesting. And not because of the food, 
which looked and smelled wonderful, but simply because she couldn't eat anything, thanks to that confounded mask. Sam, of course, seemed to take second helpings of everything solely to mock her. Selena, seated at Rolf's left, half hoped the food was poisoned. Sam had only served himself from the array of meats and stews after watching Rolf eat some himself, so the likelihood of that wish coming true was rather low. Mistress Sardothian, Rolf said, his dark brows rising high on his forehead. You must be famished. Or is my food not pleasing enough for your refined palate? Beneath the cape and the cloak and the dark tunic, Selena was not just famished, but also hot and tired. And thirsty, which combined with her temper usually turned out to be a lethal combination. Of course, they couldn't see any of that. I'm quite fine, she lied, swirling the water in her goblet. It lapped against the sides, taunting her with each rotation. Selena stopped. Maybe if you took off your mask, you might have an easier time eating, Rolf said, taking a bite of roasted duck. Unless what lies beneath it will make us lose our appetites. The five other pirates, all captains in Rolf's fleet, sniggered. Keep talking like that? Selena gripped the stem of her goblet. And I might give you a reason to wear a mask. Sam kicked her under the table, and she kicked him back, a deft blow to his shins, hard enough that he choked on his water. Some of the assembled captains stopped laughing, but Rolf chuckled. She rested her gloved hand atop the stained dining table. The table was freckled with burns and deep gouges. It had clearly seen its fair share of brawls. Didn't Rolf have any taste for luxury? Perhaps he wasn't so well off if he was resorting to the slave trade. But Arobin, Arobin was as rich as the king of Otterlin himself. Rolf flicked his sea-green eyes to Sam, who was frowning yet again. Have you seen her without the mask? Sam, to her surprise, grimaced. Once. He gave her an all-too-believably wary look. And that was enough. Rolf studied Sam for a heartbeat, then took another bite of his meat. Well, if you won't show me your face... Then perhaps you'll indulge us with the tale of how, exactly, you became protege to Arobin Hommel. I trained, she said dully, for years. We aren't all lucky enough to have a magic map inked on our hands. Some of us had to climb to the top. Rolf stiffened, and the other pirates halted their eating. He stared at her long enough for Selena to want to squirm, and then set down his fork. Sam leaned a bit closer to her, but she realized, only to see better as Rolf laid both of his hands palm up on the table. Together, his hands formed a map of their continent, and only that. This map hasn't moved for eight years. His voice was a low growl. A chill went down her spine. Eight years. Exactly the time that had passed since the Fae had been banished and executed when Otterlin had conquered and enslaved the rest of the continent, and magic had disappeared. Don't think, Rolf continued, withdrawing his hands, that I haven't had to claw and kill my way as much as you. If he was nearly thirty, then he'd probably done even more killing than she had. And from the many scars on his hands and face, it was easy to tell that he'd done a lot of clawing. Good to know we're kindred spirits she said. If Rolf was already used to getting his hands dirty, then trading slaves wasn't a stretch. But he was a filthy pirate. They were Aero Ben Hamel's assassins, educated, wealthy, refined. Slavery was beneath them. Rolf gave her that crooked smile. Do you act like this because it's actually in your nature? Or is it just because you're afraid of dealing with people? I'm the world's greatest assassin. She lifted her chin. I'm not afraid of anyone. Really? Rolf asked. Because I'm the world's greatest pirate and I'm afraid of a great number of people. That's how I've managed to stay alive for so long. She didn't deign to reply. Slave-mongering pig. He shook his head, smiling in exactly the same way she smirked at Sam when she wanted to piss him off. 
I'm surprised Arobin hasn't made you check your arrogance, Rolf said. Your companion seems to know when to keep his mouth shut. Sam coughed loudly and leaned forward. How did you become Pirate Lord, then? Rolf ran a finger along a deep groove in the wooden table. I killed every pirate who was better than me. The three other captains, all older, all more weathered and far less attractive than him, huffed but didn't refute it. Anyone arrogant enough to think they couldn't possibly lose to a young man with a patchwork crew and only one ship to his name. But they all fell, one by one. When you get a reputation like that, people tend to flock to you. Rolf glanced between Selena and Sam. You want my advice? He asked her. No. I'd watch your back around, Sam. You might be the best Sardothian, but there's always someone waiting for you to slip. Sam, the traitorous bastard, didn't hide his smirk. The other pirate captains chuckled. Selena stared hard at Rolf. Her stomach twisted with hunger. She'd eat later, swipe something from the tavern kitchens. You want my advice? He waved a hand, beckoning her to go on. Mind your own business. Rolf gave her a lazy smile. I don't mind Rolf. Sam mused later into the pitch darkness of their room. Selena, who'd taken the first watch, glared toward where his bed lay against the far wall. Of course you don't, she grumbled, relishing the free air on her face. Seated on her bed, she leaned against the wall and picked at the threads on the blanket. He told you to assassinate me. Sam chuckled. It is wise advice. She rolled up the sleeves of her tunic. Even at night, this rotten place was scorching hot. Perhaps it isn't a wise idea for you to go to sleep, then. Sam's mattress groaned as he turned over. Come on, you can't take a bit of teasing. Where my life is concerned? No. Sam snorted. Believe me, if I came home without you, Aerobin would skin me alive. Literally. If I'm going to kill you, Selena, it'll be when I can actually get away with it. She scowled. I appreciate that. She fanned her sweating face with a hand. She'd sell her soul to a pack of demons for a cool breeze right now. But they had to keep the window covered. Unless she wanted some spying pair of eyes to discover what she looked like. Though, now that she thought about it, she'd love to see the look on Rolf's face if he found out the truth. Most already knew that she was a young woman. But if he knew he was dealing with a sixteen-year-old, his pride might never recover. They'd only be here for three nights. They could both go without a little sleep if it meant keeping her identity and their lives safe. Selena? Sam asked into the dark. Should I worry about going to sleep? She blinked, then laughed under her breath. At least Sam took her threat somewhat seriously. She wished she could say the same for Rolf. No, she said. Not tonight. Some other night, then he mumbled. Within minutes, he was out. Selena rested her head against the wooden wall, listening to the sound of his breathing as the long hours of the night stretched by. Chapter Four Even when her turn to sleep came, Selena lay awake. In the hours she'd spent watching over their room, one thought had become increasingly problematic. The slaves. Perhaps if Arobin had sent someone else. Perhaps if it was just a business deal that she found out about later, when she was too busy to care. She might not have been so bothered by it. But to send her to retrieve a shipment of slaves? People who had done nothing wrong, only dared to fight for their freedom and the safety of their families. How could Arobin expect her to do that? If Ben had been alive, she might have found an ally in him. Ben, despite his profession, was the most compassionate person she knew. His death left a vacancy that she didn't think could ever be filled. She sweated so much that her sheets became damp, and slept so little that when dawn came, she felt like she'd been trampled by a herd of wild horses from the Eelway grasslands. Sam finally nudged her, 
a none too gentle prodding with the pommel of his sword. He said, You look horrible. Deciding to let that set the tone for the day, Selena got out of bed and promptly slammed the bathroom door. When she emerged a while later, as fresh as she could get using only the wash basin and her hands, she understood one thing with perfect clarity. There was no way, no way in any realm of hell, that she was going to bring those slaves to Rifthold. Rolf could keep them for all she cared, but she wouldn't be the one to transport them to the capital city. That meant she had two days to figure out how to ruin Arobin and Rolf's deal, and find a way to come out of it alive. She slung her cape over her shoulders, silently bemoaning the fact that the yards of fabric concealed much of her lovely black tunic, especially its delicate golden embroidery. Well, at least her cape was also exquisite, even if it was a bit dirty from so much traveling. Where are you going? Sam asked. He sat up from where he lounged on the bed, cleaning his nails with the tip of a dagger. Sam definitely wouldn't help her. She'd have to find a way to get out of the deal on her own. I have some questions to ask Rolf. Alone. She fastened her mask and strode to the door. I want breakfast waiting for me when I return. Sam went rigid, his lips forming a thin line. What? Selena pointed to the hallway toward the kitchen. Breakfast, she said slowly. I'm hungry. Sam opened his mouth, and she waited for the retort. But it never came. He bowed deeply. As you wish, he said. They swapped particularly vulgar gestures before she stalked down the hallway. Dodging puddles of filth, vomit, and the gods knew what else, Selena found it just a tad difficult to match Rolf's long stride. With rain clouds gathering overhead, many of the people in the street, raggedy pirates swaying where they stood, prostitutes stumbling past after a long night, barefoot orphans running amok, had begun migrating into the various ramshackle buildings. Skulls Bay wasn't a beautiful city by any definition, and many of the leaning and sagging buildings seemed to have been constructed from little more than wood and nails. Aside from its denizens, the city was most famous for Shipbreaker, the giant chain that hung across the mouth of the horseshoe-shaped bay. It had been around for centuries, and was so large that, as its name implied, it could snap the mast of any ship that came up against it. While mostly designed to discourage any attacks, it also kept anyone from sneaking off. And given that the rest of the island was covered with towering mountains, there weren't many other places for a ship to safely dock. So, any ship that wanted to enter or exit the harbor had to wait for it to be lowered under the surface, and be ready to pay a hefty fee. You have three blocks, Rolf said. Better make them count. Was he deliberately walking fast? Steadying her rising temper, Selena focused on the jagged, lush mountains hovering around the city, on the glittering curve of the bay, on the hint of sweetness in the air. She'd found Rolf just about to leave the tavern to go to a business meeting, and he'd agreed to let her ask questions as he walked. When the slaves arrive, she said, trying to sound as inconvenienced as possible, will I get the chance to inspect them, or can I trust that you're giving us a good batch? He shook his head at her impertinence, and Selena jumped over the outstretched legs of an unconscious, or dead, drunk in her path. They'll arrive tomorrow afternoon. I was planning to inspect them myself, but if you're so worried about the quality of your wares, I'll allow you to join me. Consider it a privilege. She snorted. Where? On your ship? Better to get a good sense of how everything worked, and then build her plan from there. Knowing how things operated might create some ideas for how to make the deal fall apart with as little risk as possible. I've converted a large stable at the other end of the town into a holding facility. I usually examine all the slaves there, but since you're leaving the next morning, we'll examine yours on the ship itself. She clicked her tongue loudly enough for him to hear it. And how long can I expect this to take? He raised an eyebrow. You have better things to do. Just answer the question. Thunder rumbled in the distance. They reached the docks 
which were by far the most impressive thing about the town. Ships of all shapes and sizes rocked against the wooden piers, and pirates scurried along the decks, tying down various things before the storm hit. On the horizon, lightning flashed above the lone watchtower perched along the northern entrance to the bay. The watchtower from which Shipbreaker was raised and lowered. In the flash, she'd also seen the two catapults atop one of the tower landings. If Shipbreaker didn't destroy a boat, then those catapults finished the job. Don't worry, Miss Sardafian, Rolf said, striding past the various taverns and inns that lined the docks. They had two blocks left. Your time won't be wasted, though getting through a hundred slaves will take a while. A hundred slaves on one ship? Where do they all fit? As long as you don't try to fool me, she snapped. I'll consider it time well spent. So you don't find reasons to complain, and I'm sure you'll try your best to do just that. I have another shipment of slaves being inspected at the holding facility tonight. Why don't you join me? That way you can have something to compare them to tomorrow. That would be perfect, actually. Perhaps she could merely claim the slaves weren't up to par and refuse to do business with him. And then leave, no harm done to either of them. She'd still have to face Sam, and then Aerobin. But she'd figure them out later. She waved a hand. Fine, fine. Send someone for me when it's time. The humidity was so thick she felt as if she were swimming through it. And after Aerobin's slaves are inspected? Any bit of information could later be used as a weapon against him. Are they mine to look after on the ship? Or will your men be watching them for me? Your pirates might very well think they're free to take whatever slaves they wish. Rolf clenched the hilt of his sword. It glinted in the muted light, and she admired the intricate pommel, shaped like a sea dragon's head. If I give the order that no one is to touch your slaves, then no one will touch them. Rolf said through his teeth. His annoyance was an unexpected delight. However, I'll arrange to have a few guards on the ship, if that will make you sleep easier. I wouldn't want Aerobin to think I don't take his investment seriously. They approached a blue-painted tavern, where several men in dark tunics lounged out front. At the sight of Rolf, they straightened, saluting him. His guards? Why hadn't anyone escorted him through the streets? That will be fine, she said crisply. I don't want to be here any longer than necessary. I'm sure you're eager to return to your clients in Rifthold. Rolf stopped in front of the faded door. The sign above it, swinging in the growing storm winds, said the Sea Dragon. It was also the name of his famed ship, which was docked just behind them, and really didn't look all that spectacular anyway. Perhaps this was the Pirate Lord's headquarters. And if he was making her and Sam stay at that tavern a few blocks away, then perhaps he trusted them as little as they trusted him. I think I'm more eager to return to civilized society, she said sweetly. Rolf let out a low growl and stepped onto the threshold of the tavern. Inside, it was all shadows and murmuring voices, and reeked of stale ale. Other than that, she could see nothing. One day... Rolf said, too quietly. Someone's really going to make you pay for that arrogance. Lightning made his green eyes flicker. I just hope I'm there to see it. He shut the tavern door in her face. Selena smiled, and her smile grew wider as fat drops of rain splattered on the rust-colored earth, instantly cooling the muggy air. That had gone surprisingly well. Is it poisoned? she asked Sam, plopping down on her bed as a clap of thunder shook the tavern to its foundations. The teacup rattled in its saucer, and she breathed in the smell of fresh-baked bread, sausage, and porridge as she threw back her hood and removed her mask. By them, or by me? Sam was sitting on the floor, his back against the bed. Selena sniffed all her food. Do I detect Belladonna? Sam gave her a flat stare, and Selena smirked as she tore a bite from the bread. They sat in silence for a few minutes, 
the only sounds the scrape of her utensils against the chipped plates, the drumming of the rain on the roof, and the occasional groan of a thunderhead breaking. So, Sam said, are you going to tell me what you're planning, or should I warn Rolf to expect the worst? She sipped daintily at her tea. I don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about, Sam Cortland. What sort of questions did you ask him? She set down her teacup. Rain lashed the shutters, muffling the clink of her cup against the saucer. Polite ones. Oh, I didn't think you knew what polite meant. I can be polite when it pleases me. When it gets you what you want, you mean. So what is it you want from Rolf? She studied her companion. He certainly didn't seem to have any qualms about the deal. While he might not trust Rolf, it didn't bother him that a hundred innocent souls were about to be traded like cattle. I wanted to ask him more about the map on his hands. Damn it, Selena! Sam slammed his fist onto the wooden floor. Tell me the truth. Why? she asked, giving him a pout. And how do you know I'm not telling the truth? Sam got to his feet and began pacing the length of their small room. He undid the top button of his black tunic, revealing the skin beneath. Something about it felt strangely intimate, and Selena found herself quickly looking away from him. We've grown up together, Sam stopped at the foot of her bed. You think I don't know how to tell when you're cooking up some scheme? What do you want from Rolf? If she told him, he'd do everything in his power to prevent her from ruining the deal, and having one enemy was enough. With her plans still unformed, she had to keep Sam out of it. Besides, if worse came to worst, Rolf might very well kill Sam for being involved, or simply for knowing her. Maybe I'm just unable to resist how handsome he is, she said. Sam went rigid. He's twelve years older than you. So? He didn't think she was serious, did he? He gave her a look so scathing it could have turned her to ash, and he stalked to the window, ripping his cloak down. What are you doing? He flung open the wooden shutters to reveal a sky full of rain and forked lightning. I'm sick of suffocating, and if you're interested in Rolf, he's bound to find out what you look like at some point, isn't he? So why bother slowly roasting to death? Shut the window. He only crossed his arms. Shut it, she growled. When he made no move to close the window, she jumped to her feet, upsetting the tray of food on her mattress, and shoved him aside hard enough for him to take a step back. Keeping her head down, she shut the window in shutters and threw his cape over the whole thing. Idiot, she seethed. What's gotten into you? Sam stepped closer, his breath hot on her face. I'm tired of all the melodrama and nonsense that happens whenever you wear that ridiculous mask and cloak. And I'm even more tired of you ordering me around. So that's what this was about. Get used to it. She made to turn to her bed, but he grabbed her wrist. Whatever plan you're concocting, whatever bit of intrigue you're about to drag me into, just remember that you're not head of the Assassin's Guild yet. You still answer to Aerobin. She rolled her eyes, yanking her wrist out of his grasp. Touch me again, she said, striding to her bed and picking up the spilled food. And you'll lose that hand. Sam didn't speak to her after that. Chapter 5 Dinner with Sam was silent, and Rolf appeared at eight to bring them both to the holding facility. Sam didn't even ask where they were going. He just played along, as if he'd known the whole time. The holding facility was an enormous wooden warehouse, and even from down the block, something about the place made Selena's instinct scream at her to get away. The sharp reek of unwashed bodies didn't hit her until they stepped inside, blinking against the brightness of the torches and crude chandeliers. It took her a few heartbeats to sort out what she was seeing. Rolf, striding ahead of them, didn't falter as he passed cell after cell packed with slaves. Instead, he walked toward a large open space in the rear of the warehouse, where a nut-brown eelway man stood before a cluster of four pirates. 
Beside her, Sam let out a breath, his face wan. If the smell wasn't bad enough, the people in the cells, clinging to the bars or cowering against the walls, or clutching their children. Children.